All right, the faith of Moses from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. So now as we come this evening to Hebrews chapter 11, 23 to 29, it's helpful, again, for us to remember why the apostle wrote this letter to the Hebrew Christians, okay? So he's writing to Jewish believers. These Jewish believers were facing tremendous persecution. They had left all to follow Christ. They were facing tremendous hardship, tremendous tribulation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, they had already endured a great struggle with suffering. They were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations. Many of them, as the Hebrew says, endured the plundering of their goods. Many of them had lost everything to follow Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, there were many who were becoming weary, discouraged in their faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, there were those enduring a difficult chastening from the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, they're described as having weak or tired hands, feeble knees. They become weary of fighting. Sometimes the fight gets tiring, gets sore. They became weary of striving. They feel the weight of perseverance, the need of preservation. They are tempted here in their trials, in their difficulty. They're tempted to turn back. They're tempted to forsake Christ and go back to the comfort of their old Judaism, their old false religion that they've left. And so they are in need of endurance. The Lord says that he who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And we must press forward even through difficulty. So when you get in difficulties like that, trials where it's hard and you grow weary, you may grow discouraged, your hands hang down, you feel your knees buckling under the weight of the trial that you're in. We need to be reminded that genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a victorious, triumphant faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, the inspired apostle does that through glorious examples of a God-given, conquering, and enduring faith working in people with a nature like theirs, right? These examples in Hebrews 11, they're men, women, with a nature just like we have. It's not that the people there are extraordinary. It's the God-given, triumphant, conquering, saving faith that is supernatural, that is powerful, that is full of God's might, God's work uh, to the end of the saving of our souls. And our author here in Hebrews chapter 11 knows that a strengthened faith a refined faith, a mature faith is necessary if they're going to finish the race that has been set before them. Now, our chief example, our primary example of that, that faith-filled endurance through suffering is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's our best example. And so we are always to look to him and his example. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, we are to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest we become weary and discouraged in our souls. So now as we learn, though, from our perfect example, as we imitate him, the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, encourages us with one example after another of faith working in and through others who also faced difficult circumstances, and their faith prevailed. So when you think and consider your own circumstances, your own difficulties, your own battle with sin, your own warfare, spiritual warfare in the Christian life, when you consider your difficulties, consider that faith prevails, that faith triumphs. And we have examples of that conquering faith here in the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. So tonight now we come to the faith of Moses. We see the faith of Moses commended in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. Now, the example of Moses would have been of particular interest and particularly encouraging to the recipients of this letter, Hebrew Christians. Here is Moses, the great lawgiver, right? The great lawgiver. And the example of Moses proven from their their own Old Testament scriptures. And how does the Bible say that Moses was right with God? How is it that God worked through Moses, the great lawgiver? And specifically, was Moses looking forward to Christ? And the answer of all these questions is an affirmative yes, right? Moses was right with God through faith, not through works of the law. Moses, the lawgiver, 
put his faith and trust in the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God was at work in him and through him to do and to do according to God's good pleasure by the means of Moses' faith. And specifically, it says here in our text that Moses was looking forward to Christ and looking forward to the reward. So now, if you remember, we're going through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings. If you remember the account of Jesus healing the man born blind in John chapter 9, it says there of that man who was healed at the temple that the Jews reviled him for being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, many Hebrew Christians at this point in time were reviled for being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had left Judaism and now it's stepped out. As Hebrew says, they've gone outside the camp to bear the reproach of Christ. They've gone forth to him bearing his reproach and they're being persecuted for it. And this man in John chapter 9 reviled for being a disciple of Jesus just as they were. Those Jews reviling the man born blind in John chapter 9 boasted in the fact that they were Moses' disciple. We're disciples of Moses, right? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 11, in whom was Moses trusting? (laughs) He was trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was he looking to? He was looking to the coming Christ. He had his faith and his trust in God's promises in Christ. Now, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 3, that the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness and sought to establish their own righteousness through keeping the law of Moses. Now, in doing that, Paul says they didn't submit to the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Christ. Well, how was Moses made righteous? On what basis did Moses submit to God? We'll find in our text here that Moses was made righteous by God through the vehicle of faith. Moses submitted himself to God through the vehicle of faith. The same way that these Hebrew Christians are to submit themselves to God through faith, in the same way that you and I, as we live the Christian lives, we must submit ourselves daily, hourly, minute by minute. We have to submit ourselves to God in Christ through the vehicle of faith. And Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen? Amen. I want want you to see the faith of Moses here in our text from three different perspectives. From three different perspectives. One, I want you to see this from the perspective of the deliverance of faith in verse 23. We want to look at the determination of faith in verses 24 through 27 and the dependence of faith in verses 28 and 29. So point one, the deliverance of faith in verse 23. Point two, the determination of faith in verses 24 to 27. And point three, the dependence of faith in verses 28 and 29. So first, let's take a look at point one, the deliverance of faith in verse 23 where the Bible reads, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. That's interesting here in a passage commending the faith of Moses, that we first see the faith of his parents in action, right? Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say that by faith the parents of Moses when he was born was hidden. It says by faith Moses when he was born was hidden. Now, that points out several things to us, okay? The first is this. It's clear that Moses isn't the priority. It's faith. Faith is the priority here. This is not a a commendation necessarily of Moses the man. The emphasis here is on Moses' faith. Priority here is faith. That's also clear that even when Moses was a baby... God was sovereignly and providentially working through the means of faith, in this case his parents' faith, to providentially protect and preserve Moses. God always working through faith. That has a lesson for us, doesn't it? When you want to battle sin, put faith in Christ. Exercise your faith. When you want to trust God, cultivate faith in God. When you want to worship Christ, cultivate faith in Christ. When you want to make it through a trial, make it through a difficulty, put your faith and trust in Christ. How do you do that? You do that through prayer. 
Do that through reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the Word of God, depending upon God, obeying God, trusting Him, trusting Him even when it's difficult, trusting Him especially when it's difficult. Now, the original account of this, this account record of Moses, originally takes place in Exodus chapter 1. Turn there with me, Exodus chapter 1. Let's take a look at this in its context. Exodus chapter 1. We want to read this account and then make a couple of observations here from our text. So Exodus chapter 1. And beginning in verse 8. So the Israelites were growing. The Lord was blessing them. They're increasing in number in the land of Egypt. And then in verse 8. The Bible says there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, the people of Egypt, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. You see what he's concerned about, right? Verse 11. Uh, in this text, they... The Pharaoh, king of Egypt, took three steps to try to guard themselves or protect themselves from a growing number of Israelites in the land. Here's the first, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. They built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. It's like the, you know... Um, Jacob's sheep under Laban, right? No matter, no matter what he did, the sheep kept multiplying. God kept blessing. Same thing here. No matter what they do, the Israelites just keep growing, just keep multiplying. Lord's blessing on them. And they were, the Egyptians were in dread of the children of Israel. Verse 13. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel severe or serve with rigor, severe hardship, right? Verse 14. They made their lives bitter, with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Then, here's the second thing that Pharaoh did. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives, not fearing man, but fearing God here, the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. They just kept multiplying. So it was, verse 21, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. You understand that, that that notion of fearing God, that understanding of fearing God from Scripture, is exercising faith in God, right? You fear God more than man, and so you trust him, you obey him. It's the fear of God. Verse 22, so then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, this is the third thing that Pharaoh attempts to do, every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. This has particular bearing on Moses. So it begins in chapter 2, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as his wife a daughter of Levi. And so the woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. We saw that recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 3, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Verse 5, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. When she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew's children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. 
And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child, Moses, grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. He became uh, her son. And so she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. So Pharaoh, concerned about the growth of the Israelites then, back in Hebrews chapter 11, one, afflicted them with hard taskmasters. Two, told the Hebrew midwives to kill all the newborn sons. And three, commanded people to throw the newborn sons into the river. Now from Exodus chapter 6, we know that the parents of Moses were Amram and Jochebed. Amram and Jochebed. And in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23, it says that Amram and Jochebed hid Moses for three months. Hid Moses for three months. Now in this section, in verse 23... There's one means that this is done by, and two reasons, two reasons given for doing this. The one means is the means of faith. By faith, Amram and Jochebed hid Moses for three months. Now consider this with me for a moment, and think about this, and put yourself in their context. Faith being the substance of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen. By faith implies here that Amram and Jochebed were given some sort of instruction, right? Instructed to protect or hide Moses. Maybe they just believed in God and trusted in God's law that said, do not murder. And so they wanted to hide Moses. Whatever the case may be, this was by trusting God that they hid Moses for three months. Now certainly, if you can consider their faith while they did this, they cried out to God for those three months, right? You got a baby in the house. This is this would have incurred a severe penalty from Pharaoh had they been caught, probably death. And yet for three months, they hid this baby in their house. Surely they would have been praying daily, hourly, right? Praying for God to protect them and protect the baby. They were crying out to God. They were trusting God, praying continuously, perseverance. Certainly they were vigilant, right? They were, this was a tough time. It was a tough time, and they needed an enduring faith to make it through these three months. So that's the means. The one means was faith. By faith, they hid Moses three months. But then, two reasons are given. One, the first reason given, this is interesting, it's because they saw that he was a beautiful child. Now, the word there, beautiful, doesn't have as much to do with appearance as it does with conduct or character, right? So they saw that this word literally means refined, refined or stately. Another word that they use is elegant. It's got a, a semantic range there. Stately, refined. He was stately or refined in his behavior, refined in his conduct. In some way, God marked Moses even as a baby to have something different about him. And Amram and Jochebed saw it. So they hid him. One of the reasons they hid him because they saw that he was marked by God or beautiful, stately, important to God. I'm grateful, and you should be grateful too, that all of this that in nothing to do with Christianity is anything based upon work, uh, based upon looks, right? I'm especially grateful for that considering Pastor Rick. And so uh, thankful that it's based on faith and not on your looks. They saw that he was a beautiful child. Secondly, it says there that they hid Moses three months because they were not afraid of the king's command. They were not afraid of the king's command. Like the Hebrew midwives, right? They, they feared an authority that was far greater than Pharaoh. Like Peter and John, if you remember the account in Acts chapter 4. They were taken, beaten, reprimanded, rebuked. And Peter and John said it would be far better for them, right for them, to obey God rather than men. That's exactly what Amram and Jochebed are doing here. They're obeying God rather than men. They feared God rather than fearing Pharaoh. Now, if you think about this, due to a faith-filled fear of God, the people of God are delivered from a fear of man. You see that? Faith produces courage. Faith produces, God-given faith produces boldness. The righteous are as bold as a lion, right? The Bible says. 
So God-given, God-gifted, spirit-fueled faith delivers God's people from the fear of man. Faith produces courage. In that, who gets the glory? Do you get glory for that? No, entirely God. God gets the glory. God gets the glory for that. that. God shows his power through weak people. Here in this circumstance, certainly Amram and Jochebed were weak, apart from the grace of God in Christ to them through faith. He gloriously, God gloriously works through the faith of his people. So, when you face the fear of man, maybe you're fearful walking up to somebody to share the gospel. Maybe you're fearful that you'll ever overcome sin in your life, right? That particular sin that you're battling most fiercely. Maybe you're out and you're open air preaching. You're preaching to a hostile crowd. Fear God rather than men. And when you fear God, when you exercise a God-gifted, spirit-empowered faith, God gives you victory over the fear of man. God delivers you from a fear of man when you exercise faith in him. Do you want to overcome fear of man? If you struggle with a fear of man, put faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. Exercise faith. Cultivate faith in Christ. Now, who else does this remind us of? You know, in this sense, we saw the example of the Hebrew midwives, how they exercised faith, Peter and John in Acts 4. This also reminds us of the decision of Mary and Joseph, doesn't it? Mary and Joseph fled Bethlehem with Christ after the order of Herod in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, to kill all the male children in Bethlehem under the age of two, right? And in this, if you think about it, and I'll let you explore this more on your own, Moses here becomes a picture of the deliverer, becomes a picture of Christ. But it's important to note here that fearing God certainly brought Amram and Jochebed closer to very real danger with Pharaoh, right? Fearing God, obeying God, brought them into proximity of danger with Pharaoh, but it preserved them in a place of blessing, in a place of security, and in a place of safety with God. Spiritual safety, eternal safety, right? All right. So the deliverance of faith. We saw that Moses delivered, and here specifically by the faith of his parents. Next, in point two, we see the determination of faith in verses 24 to 27. As Moses comes of age, we see the determination of faith. Verse 24 says this, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." Now, the faith of Moses here in verses 24 to 27, marked by three sets or three couplets of actions in these verses. First, he refuses and chooses in verses 24 and 25. Secondly, you'll notice, he esteems and hopes in verse 26. And lastly, in verse 27, he forsakes and endures. He refuses and chooses. He esteems and hopes. He forsakes and endures. First, he refuses and he chooses in verses 24 and 25. By faith, when he became of age, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So first thing here that Moses does is he refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refuses. In other words, faith here isn't merely a deeply held belief. It's not just you agreeing with a set of facts. We're not talking about mental or intellectual assent. It's not simply confidence that some facts about Jesus Christ are true. True saving faith, if it's genuine, if it's a gift of God, if it's saving, true saving faith works. True saving faith decides. True saving faith denies. True saving faith refuses. True saving faith chooses. 
And right here, faith is depicted as a, as a decision of Moses' mind, as an act of his will. It was the resolved determination and personal choice of Moses to act on his faith. And in this way, faith works. And faith without works, as James would say, is dead. Moses here acts on his faith. And what does he do? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses refuses a comfortable lifestyle. He refuses privilege and wealth, right? Moses refuses ease and refuses comfort, refuses affluence. He refuses those things that would be pleasing to our flesh, right? Self-indulgent things. Can you imagine the food in Pharaoh's household compared to the food before the manna and the quail in the wilderness, right? The people were complaining about the food they had in the wilderness. Moses refused ease, refused affluence. He refused those people that he grew up with, right? He refused Pharaoh's daughter, the one who raised him. He refused godless company. That's certainly what the Egyptians were. And he determines that whatever comes, Moses determines to submit to whatever trials he's going to face. And Moses is going to face trials, right? Forty years in the wilderness. Not just 40 years in the wilderness, but 40 years in the wilderness with a stiff-necked and rebellious people, right? Rebellion, complaining. And by faith, Moses denies himself, takes up his cross, so to speak, and follows Christ. So he refuses in verse 24. In verse 25, he chooses. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now he characterizes much of what he refuses in Egypt as the passing pleasures of sin. He refuses those things. Refuses the passing pleasures of sin. He turns away from godless company. Chooses fellowship with the despised and rejected and afflicted saints of God. And this turning here, right, refusing and choosing, is a picture of repentant faith. You turn from your idols, you turn from your former life, you turn from your sin, and you turn to Christ. And with Paul, and turning to Christ in that way, Moses could say with Paul in Philippians chapter 3, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom? For Christ I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith that for the purpose that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the death, from the dead. So he refuses and he chooses. Next, in verse 26, he esteems and he hopes. In verse 26, by faith Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. A.W. Pink says that Temporal blessings, blessings in this life, become a curse if they are allowed to hinder us from the discharge of any duty to God. Now consider that for a moment. You have the blessing of entertainment, right? Rest and relaxation. relaxation. We need that. But rest and relaxation, entertainments, become a curse to you if those things are allowed to hinder you from the discharge of any duty to God. And leave them behind. Refuse those. Moses here esteems the reproach of Christ and he himself becomes despised and rejected with the people of God. He endured hardships. Hardships of the wilderness wandering. He endured the hardships of leading those people. Moses had to endure those things. Why? Because he wanted Christ. He wanted Christ. For the sake of Christ, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches, uh, greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. Moses here, again, a picture of conversion. Moses heard the truth. He believed the truth wholeheartedly. And then Moses acted in accord with the truth. He took action. 
Let me ask you tonight, you know, if you're considering these things and you consider the example of Moses here, is the denying of yourself or the taking up of your cross something that you grudgingly do? Or is it something that you rejoice to do? Is it something that you grudgingly bear? You look at Christianity like do this and don't do that, rules and regulations? Or is the denying of yourself, is the taking up of your cross something that you rejoice to do for the sake of Christ? Listen, the reproach of Christ, the reproach of Christ is greater riches than all the treasures of this world. What will a man give in exchange for his soul, right? Nothing. Nothing if he's in Christ. Nothing if he has a, a shred of his wits about him. Nothing. Choose Christ. Why? Why did Moses do this? Why did Moses esteem the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt? Because it says here in verse 26 that he looked forward to the reward. He hoped. He hoped in the reward. This hope the reward is what strengthened and supported his faith. It was, um, it was the undergirding of his faith, the skeleton of his faith, so to speak. The Bible says that he who has this hope in him purifies himself just as Christ is pure. Think about Moses. He would have never forsaken the pleasures or comforts of Egypt had his heart not been focused on the eternal reward of God in Christ, Right? Moses knew. Moses knew he'd be no loser in that choice. He looked forward to the, re to the reward. Lastly, though, now in verse 27, he refuses, he chooses, he esteems, he hopes. Verse 27, he forsakes and endures. Verse 27, by faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Like his parents, like the Hebrew midwives, Moses did not fear the king. He leaves Egypt. Now, this, when, he, when it says that he forsook Egypt, this was at the Exodus. It wasn't the first time. The first time that Moses left Egypt, he left in fear, right? But at the Exodus, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He sets out into the wilderness as Abraham did, simply trusting the Lord. And his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. The word endured in verse 27 tells us the state of Moses' determination, the state of Moses' resolve, he endured. And look at all that he endured. That word endured has a root that means strength or fortitude, right? To bear evils, to undergo dangers, to do all that with courage, with a resolved heart, a resolved mind, so that you don't faint under the weight of them. You hold on, persevering to the end. That word endured speaks of the determination of Moses' faith. Now, what motivated, what fueled his endurance? The end of verse 27, seeing him who is invisible. Seeing him who is invisible. How do you see him who is invisible? Do that through his revealed word, right? Do that through his revealed word. You see the invisible God revealed in his word. If you're going to put faith in Christ, right? If you're going to live this Christian life by faith, that faith must be cultivated. That faith must be fueled. It must be nourished. It must be built. It must be matured. And the way that faith gets nourished, cultivated, built, matured, refined is through the Word of God. In the Word of God, we see Christ revealed. We see the invisible God revealed to us. We need to see Him who is invisible. And the more that we see Him who is invisible, the more that we see Christ, we, as John says, right, having loved him, though we have not seen him, and although we have not seen him, we love him, seeing him in the pages of Scripture, him who is invisible, fuels our faith, matures our faith, grows our faith, flames, inflames our faith. 
That is through the word of God as God in his provident wisdom would have it. We have to nourish that faith through the Bible. If you're not spending time in God's word, you're not getting to know him. Listen, and as God reveals himself to you in his word, he conforms you into that image. As you see him revealed, we become more and more like him until one day when faith becomes sight and we stand before him, we will become like him, the Bible says, because we will see him as he is. We're conformed into that image. You need to cultivate, pursue those things that strengthen faith. You need to avoid, you need to refuse those things that weaken faith. You have to pursue faith. That's the Christian life, right? The Christian life. In this life, we are to pursue faith in Christ. It's through the vehicle of faith. It's by grace, through faith, that God directs us in this life. Thirdly, point three on your notes. We see the dependence of faith in verses 28 and 29. The dependence of faith. Verse 28, by faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, in verse 29, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Moses depended upon God. Moses trusted God. Everything builds to this point, right? Everything builds... In this example of Moses' faith, everything builds to verses 28 and 29. Refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Forsaking Egypt. All of that would have been for nothing spiritually had he not turned from that to turn to Christ, right? Had he not turned to God. Turning away from the world is not enough. You must turn to Christ. Put off the old man. What do you do? Put on the new man. You set this down. You pick this up. That goes away. Don't leave the vacuum there. Put on Christ. It's not enough to simply turn away from the world. You must also be turning to God. It's not enough to forsake sin. You must put on righteousness. There must be a, a laying a hold of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So in verse 28, he observed the Passover. Observed the Passover in full faith, full assurance. And the Hebrews were just as exposed to the angel of death as were the Egyptians. And what was the difference? By faith, they obeyed God and put the blood on the lintels and the doorposts of their house. And they were passed over by the angel of death. All would have been for nothing. They could have prayed all night. They could have observed every other aspect, but it had, had it not been for the blood on the doorpost, they would have been subject to the death of the firstborn in the same way that the Egyptians were. And that's a picture of Christ. In verse 29, Moses and those saved Israelites, those believing Israelites, passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Notice there that the they... It's not speaking of all of Israel. It doesn't say the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea. It says they, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea. Those who believed passed through the Red Sea by faith. Others later were proven to have no faith. And the Lord says that he swore in his wrath they would not enter his rest because they were faithless. And when it came time to enter the promised land, they refused. They proved they had no faith in God. The Egyptians followed through by blind hatred, blind anger. And they were extremely presumptuous, right? You see the wall of water on either, either side and dry land down the middle. And the Egyptians just take off into the middle of the Red Sea presumptuously in their blind hatred, their blind anger. And they were drowned. Every one of them died. Genuine saving faith. Genuine saving faith will enable the Christian to pass through trials and difficulties that would drown others. 
genuine saving faith. It's not a, a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing. It's not in and of man. It is from God. It's interesting thinking about that they in verse 29. That unbelievers, unbelievers are often the beneficiaries of the blessings that result from their association with genuine believers, right? We see that spoken of in the New Testament of a husband and his unbelieving wife or husband and wife and their unbelieving children. A household, that household gets blessed by the believer. That workplace gets blessed by that saved employee. That class is blessed by having a saved, diligent, Christ-like student. Unbelievers are often the recipients of blessings as a result of their association with the people of God. So what, are we take, what are we to take away from this? Right? Genuine saving faith is not a fragile faith. Genuine saving faith endures. Genuine saving faith perseveres. God works through genuine saving faith to preserve his own. But listen, genuine saving faith works Genuine saving faith acts. Genuine saving faith decides. Genuine saving faith chooses. Genuine saving faith resolves. Genuine saving faith determines. Genuine saving faith takes action on the promises of God. Genuine saving faith looks forward in hope to the promises of God and lives this life in view of those promises. Let's put our faith and trust in Christ and follow the example Certainly of the faith that work in Moses, but more assuredly of that faith that we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this text. Thank you, Lord, for a supernatural, God-given, grace-endowed faith. We praise you, Lord, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we ask you, Lord, we plead with you tonight, Lord, through your word, by your spirit, mature our faith, grow our faith, cause us, Lord, to move from faith to faith. Or may we follow you, obey you. God, I pray that we would exercise ourselves toward godliness, strive in this most holy and precious faith to live for you, to obey you, to please you, to learn of you. Help us, Lord, to refuse those things that hinder our faith and choose those blessed means that grow and mature our faith. Help us, Lord, to esteem the reproaches of Christ greater than all the riches of this wicked world. And help us, Lord, to look forward to that reward. And help us as we look forward to that reward, Lord, as we hope in him to purify ourselves as he is pure. Thank you, Lord, for the example of Moses. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder that is genuine God-given saving faith that is at work in Moses to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And I pray, Lord, that in us you would be glorified in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.